Uh, well, thank you guys for joining us today for the launch of our Distinguished Speaker Series. We're very excited to have you all. Um, I know you guys are all here to hear Dr. Eglash speak, uh, but before we begin, I just wanted to give you all a brief introduction to Tech Code because I see some new faces in the audience. So I just want to let you know what we at Tech Code are all about. So um, we focus on incubation, operation, and technology startup cultivation, and we're committed to building the world's leading entrepreneurship ecosystem. In the year and a half since our launch, we have already developed a deep presence around the world. We have offices in Silicon Valley here, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Tel Aviv, Berlin, and Seoul. So many places, and we're going to open uh, offices in even more countries this year. Uh, we provide co-working space, funding, mentorship, and supply chain resources, leveraging our international network to help our portfolio companies integrate key innovative elements from around the world. So today is the launch of our Distinguished Speaker Series, as you know, um, and this is just one of several initiatives that we're launching in 2016. Um, another big initiative we're launching is we're, uh, our first accelerator program sometime in spring. It's going to focus on artificial intelligence plus hardware. So some of you guys might be inter interested in that since you came to a talk on AI and big data. So if you have any questions about that, uh, come up and see me afterwards, uh, me or Steve, my colleague here, uh, afterwards. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to your guest of honor tonight. Dr. Steve Eglash. Uh, Dr. Eglash is Executive Director of Stanford's Programs on Big Data, Artificial Intelligence, and the Internet of Things. Dr. Eglash structures and manages research programs and advises many companies and governments. He has been CEO of a solar energy company, a consultant for the U.S. Department of Energy, a venture capitalist, a business executive, and a research scientist. He has attended Stanford and Berkeley with a PhD from Stanford and a BS from UC Berkeley, both in electrical engineering. I asked him who he roots for when Cal and Stanford plays, and I don't think he takes sides, so good for you on that. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, he is also a fellow of the International Society for Optics and Photonics, a former board member of the Materials Research Society, a member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer, uh, and a member of the Optical Society, and a member of the Association for Computing Machinery. So he does a lot. And I just learned in his spare time, he also is a soccer referee. So he uh, does have a lot of fun things going on in his life. So Dr. Eglash, please come up. Thanks a lot. It's great to be here. It's great to see everybody. I want to talk to you today about what every entrepreneur needs to know about trends in artificial intelligence, big data, and the Internet of Things. I want to talk about what I think are some of the key trends in those areas and what they mean for startups and big companies, and then talk a bit about innovation and how to apply this to companies like the ones you're involved in or maybe the ones you're thinking of starting tomorrow. The popular press, whether we're talking about blogs, or websites, newspapers, or magazines, seems to have decided that we're in the midst of a revolution in big data and artificial intelligence. Every day you can go to the web or the print media and find new articles talking about massive data, talking about machines acting more like humans, talking about the proliferation of sensors everywhere. On the other hand, what's really new? We've all been collecting, analyzing, and using data for a long time. So let me begin by asking you, because I know some people think we're living in the midst of a data revolution, and others think that it's really just what's been going on for a long time. How many of you think that this is a data revolution that we're living in now? A lot of hands. And how many of you think it's really nothing new? It's the same as it's always been. <laughs> a similar number. So different points of view. We'll see how that goes as we continue talking about it. I think there's a revolution. 
and I think there's a revolution for these reasons. First of all, there's more data than ever before. There's more data because of the proliferation of sensors that we call the Internet of Things. There's more data because organizations like Google and Amazon are tracking our shopping patterns and our email communications. There's more data because we have social networks and organizations like Facebook and Twitter generating data. So we have more data, more sources of data. Data storage has become so cheap that we can afford to store all of this data. And once we have the data, we have fantastically more powerful compute than we ever had before, thanks to things like GPU clusters. And access to that compute power through cloud computing, as well as our own dedicated hardware. And the algorithms for doing data mining, for doing machine learning and deep learning, for doing computer vision, for doing natural language processing, are phenomenally more powerful than they were just a few days, a few years ago. And thanks to those smartphones that we all have in our pockets, we have ever more ways to interact with that data, even when we're on the go. In fact, I think what's going on is more than just a revolution in big data. I think it's a convergence of artificial intelligence, big data, and the Internet of Things. It seems to me that the distinctions between these fields that used to feel sharp, these used to feel like distinct fields, are increasingly feeling like one coherent integrated field. I don't know that we have a good name for this. I'll call it data science, but I'm sure I'll hear from you later if you have other suggestions on what to call it. But I think this increased amount of data and this convergence of these fields is leading to what I would call the revolution in data science. But what does that really mean? What are the consequences and results of that revolution? That's where I think it starts to get really interesting. And I would call these the meta themes. And I've identified these seven meta themes. You may have others in mind. Maybe I should ask you in a minute what other consequences of the data revolution you can think of. But let me tell you the seven that I see. First, the ability to act on individuals rather than averages. Imagine a large population of objects, of human beings or something else. Imagine millions or maybe hundreds of millions. In the past, the techniques for dealing with something like that were statistical. We could calculate averages, standard deviations, merits of asymmetry. Or we could deal with each case individually, which can be prohibitive for hundreds of millions of cases. And you lose the ability to apply the information from the larger population to the individual. But as I'll talk about later tonight, we now have techniques like segmentation and resolution emerging that allow us to take very large populations and divide them into small clusters of similar and like individuals. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Machine learning and deep learning are techniques that allow us to go in to large, complex, and often heterogeneous and messy data and extract insights. The ability to search and extract information not only from unstructured and structured data, but also semi-structured data. I'll say more about this in a few minutes as well. By unstructured data, I mean Google text search. You've probably all done it a dozen times today already. And as you know, it's phenomenally good. If you have, you know, most of us just type a couple of nouns when we're doing a Google search. But if you haven't tried to push the limits of Google search recently, you should try that tonight or tomorrow. And Google's gotten pretty good at interpreting rather complex queries. It's also pretty easy to create a query so complex that simple Google text search breaks. And of course, it's kind of funny when it breaks and you get answers that indicate that it's completely misjudged what you're looking for. But nonetheless, it's clearly a great technique for searching unstructured text. 
By structured data, I mean things like spreadsheets and relational databases. And of course, computers are terrific at that. But by semi-structured data, I mean the charts and graphs and tables and figures that occupy newspaper and magazine articles, websites, the scientific literature. And so I'll talk tonight about techniques emerging that can search semi-structured data. When I talk about the opportunity to transition from retrospective analysis and prediction to what-if scenario planning, I'm talking about this notion that in the past, we used data to confirm some hypothesis that we have. You have an idea, then you go to the data to prove or disprove the idea. Or maybe you're running a company and you do something like a period end, a quarter end, or a year end financial close. And for a large complex company, it might take days or weeks to do that financial close for that period. But now, thanks to advanced data and data computation techniques, we can increasingly use data for discovery. We can go discover things that we didn't know we were looking for. Or in the example of the company's financial close, it now takes minutes in many cases instead of days and weeks. So now it can be part of scenario analysis and what if planning. I'll also talk in a minute about how statistical and probabilistic approaches are increasingly replacing deterministic <coughs> calculations. And not only that, they're often more accurate than the deterministic approaches that they're replacing. How could that be? How could something statistical and probabilistic be more accurate than something deterministic? And it's because of the massive amounts of data. And we'll talk about an application for that. Contextual and human-centered interactions increasingly our computers, our smartphones, our intelligent automobiles aren't just going to give us answers that are factually correct, but answers that are attuned to what we're doing at that moment and the mood we're in. Wouldn't it be nice if when your car's GPS advises you on a route to get to tech code, it knows whether you want the shortest path or maybe you're talking to a passenger and you want the smoothest and least distracting have. And so increasingly, our computers are going to understand the state we're in and the context of our request and answer accordingly. And perhaps at the most leading edge of all is this notion of automated decision making. To move from computers providing data that can help us to make decisions to where the computers increasingly can make decisions on our behalf. And as that happens, how do we all interact with that? How does automated decision making interact with us and figure out when to defer to us and not? It's a big question. We'll see where that goes. So I think these are the meta themes, the consequences of what I call the data science revolution. That may all seem a little bit abstract. So what I'd like to do next is go into three of these and share examples with you. And the first one I want to talk about is this notion of segmentation and resolution. And I want to talk about how it's being used to design demand response systems for the smart grid. So as you know, on the electric grid, at every moment, electrical generation needs to be balanced with electrical consumption. And so we need enough power plants, enough solar panels, enough wind turbines to meet peak electric demand in California to meet that hot summer afternoon when everyone is running their air conditioners at maximum and all of the state's factories are also running at maximum. That means that you design your electrical generation capacity for the few hours each year of peak demand. Wouldn't it be great if at those moments of peak demand we could find a way to reduce demand and not have to turn on those least expensive or most polluting power plants. In the worst case, you have times where demand exceeds supply. And if you can't curtail demand, you'll have brownouts or blackouts. So as most of you know, a demand response system is a system that allows a utility or a system operator to identify that a case has occurred where we want people to shut off some of their demand and perhaps move it to another time of day when demand is less and demand and supply can be 
more equally connected. Traditionally, demand response programs have been really hard to implement. There's a lot at stake here. If a utility calls a demand response event and too many people participate, then the utility loses revenue. Too much demand has been turned off. If, on the other hand, the utility calls a demand response event and not enough people shed load, then you have brownouts and blackouts anyway. So what you want are predictable demand response events. This is work by my colleagues with Jagapal, Flora, Quack, and colleagues at Stanford. And the goal was to design a flexible and predictable demand response program. This is an image of a 24-hour load shape for a particular household. It's called a double-peaked load shape. And you can see the sensibility of this. In the middle of the night, you don't use much electricity. You wake up in the morning, and you make breakfast, and you turn on lights, and you use a lot more electricity. That's what's going on here. Then you go to work in the middle of the day, and since this is a residential load profile, you use less electricity. And then you come home at night, and you use more electricity again. Prior to Rajaga Paul's work, the conventional wisdom was that most households had a double-peaked profile. And demand response systems were designed on the assumption that everyone had this double-peaked profile. Prior work looked at data from maybe 100 customers and maybe a total of 9,000 load chains. Using techniques of modern data analytics and big data, in this work where Jagapal et al. looked at more than 200,000 customers and more than 66,000 load shapes. But he didn't just average them. He used techniques of resolution and segmentation and clustering. The challenge here, and the reason why you, this is hard and you need sophisticated mathematics, is you have to decide, if I'm going to take 66 million load shapes and put them into a few categories of similar load shapes, how do you do that? What does similar mean? What's a mathematical definition of similar? How different is different enough that it becomes a different bucket to put it in? How do you describe that to a computer? How do you figure out if you need five or 10 load shapes, or 100 or 200 load shapes? So that's the mathematics of, so the mathematics of segmentation and resolution answers that question. And here on the right, you can see 16 of these buckets that were found in this work. And what jumps out right away is how few of them are double peak load profiles, even though the average and aggregate load profile was a double peak load profile. Most of the individual load profiles are not. It's as if you're doing medical research and half of your subjects are overweight and half are underweight, and you average them and everybody's the perfect weight. You've averaged away everything that's useful and interesting in the data. I'm sure you can all imagine lots of applications from other businesses that you're in where something similar happens. So what Rajagopal did was, using these actual load profiles, develop a system that allows the utility at any moment to identify those customers that could actually profit from shedding load if there was a demand response event. And then the utility would reach out only to those customers. And the program was a huge success. And in fact, is now being, the results are now being used by PG&E, the large California utility, as I mentioned, they identify the customers that have the potential to contribute to a demand response event. The program is then designed for these clusters, these individual <coughs> homogeneous groups, not for the entire population. The economic incentives can be designed so everyone profits, the utility and the homeowners that are being asked to shed load. And most important, the result is now predictable. Now, when a utility wants to do a demand response event, they know how many megawatts of peak load they want to shed, and they can reach out to the right number of customers and do it in an effective and predictable way. And these systems can be designed passively, where the users have opted in in advance and you don't need the user's permission at that moment, or actively, where the users get, for instance, an indication on their cell phone, or maybe it's set up where, they, where the utility can communicate directly with their appliances. Switching gears now, I want to talk about an example 
of, of new techniques that can read the semi-structured data that I talked about earlier as effectively as structured and unstructured data. The software I'm going to talk about is called Deep Dive, and the application I'm going to talk about is identifying human sex trafficking on the web so that law enforcement officials can go after it. Deep Dive is open source software that combines elements of machine learning, natural language processing, and knowledge-based construction. Knowledge-based construction. And it is agnostic to the form of the data. It is equally effective against text data, against databases, or different kinds of tables and charts and graphs. This is work by Ray, Wu, Riadoto, and Zhang at Stanford, Caparella at the University of Michigan, and Shapiro and Borowitz at a company called Giant Oak. And the goal was to try to identify human sex traffickers on the web, in particular from the dark web. Before I tell you how they did that, let me tell you a little bit more about Deep Dive and what it's being used, because I think it's a remarkable piece of software. It's really a scalable, high-performance inference and learning engine. And as I mentioned, it combines elements of machine learning and natural language processing. It's been used to build more than a dozen different applications by companies and government agencies. It's been used to index the data sets that I list here, PubMed and Biomed Central, Google Patents, Wikipedia, various libraries, and web crawls. In this case, what the researchers did was they used Deep Dive to crawl 27.4 million web pages on the dark web. Human trafficking, of course, is a human rights disaster whether it's of sex workers, of forced laborers, or anything else. In the same way that the web has helped legitimate users do business, the web, and in particular the dark web, has made it easier for criminals to also do their business. And so the idea here was to see if some of these advanced data science techniques like deep dive can be used <coughs> to detect the people who are actually doing human trafficking. So this slide is a schematic view of the process. The first step was to go to all of the text on these 27.4 million websites. The phone numbers, the prices, the services being offered, the cities where the people are available, everything on those websites. In its current incarnation, human beings then have to create the empty database schema Think of it as creating the columns on a spreadsheet or the fields for each record of a database. So in this case, you have to know what you're looking for. In the future, maybe that can be automated as well. And then, every one of those 27.4 million websites is used to essentially populate that chart using probabilistic techniques. And then statistics are used to analyze the data. This has been wildly successful, and in fact, DARPA is now using Deep Dive and this software to help identify other kinds of human trafficking uh, on the web, and law enforcement officials in many states are using this. There were a number of complications that needed to be addressed. The primary one is the similarity between human trafficking and the legal escort economy. If the goal of this is to give actionable information to state attorneys general and law enforcement officials, you want to make sure that you're actually identifying the criminals, not people engaging in legal activities. And it turns out that using the data and the statistics, they were able to distinguish by looking, of all things, at prices being charged and comparing that with local unemployment rates in whatever the cities were where the services being offered. They're able to give a prioritized list based on the most likely criminals to law enforcement officials. It's being used for prosecution uh, widely throughout the U.S. today. The third example that I want to talk about is the rise of statistical and probabilistic techniques 
over the deterministic techniques that they replace. And here I want to talk about Markov decision processes and how they're being used to redesign commercial aircraft <coughs> collision avoidance systems. Today, all commercial aircraft use a system called TCAS, which stands for Traffic Alert and Collision Avoidance System. And here, these researchers have designed what would be the next generation of TCAS, which is called ACAS-X, Airborne Collision Avoidance System X. This is work by Kochenderfer, who's now at Stanford, but he did this work when he was at MIT Lincoln Lab, and his co-workers Holland and Chris Amphikopoulos and Weibel. None of us are old enough to remember, but in the early years of commercial aviation, there were so few airplanes and the sky was so big that no one thought that there was much chance of mid-air collisions. What are the chances? What could possibly go wrong? And then in the 1950s, planes started crashing into other planes in the sky. And here I show some newspaper articles from a famous 1956 collision of a United Airlines and TWA flight over the Grand Canyon. As people realized that the density of airplanes was getting to where two airplanes could, in fact, collide in the sky. This ultimately led to the formation of the Federal Aviation Administration, and then after several years to the development of the TCAS system. TCAS works by airplanes talking to each other. They can interrogate each other, they can send out information on their altitude and their heading. And based on that information, software, shown here in pseudocode, <coughs> figures out if the two planes are on a collision course or not. And based on that calculation, if the planes are in fact on a collision course, gives the pilots instructions of what to do about it. Climb, you can go down, and of course, the instructions between the two planes needs to be coordinated. You're probably going to tell one plane to climb and another plane to descend. This has been the system protecting commercial aircraft from colliding with each other for many years. And it's worked great, but it's beginning to show various strains of age. Because it all runs with complex pseudocode, changes are incredibly hard to make and implement. Imagine being the person who has to make changes to the code and then debug it to assure that your update is going to work well. Incorporating new <coughs> technologies like GPS is difficult. Systems like closely spaced parallel runways are a problem. Situations where you give one instruction to a pilot, but then the pilot ignores and disobeys the instruction has caused problems. So as good as the system is, it's reached its limits. And so over the last several years, a group was at work to design the next generation of commercial aircraft collision avoidance. And the approach they took was to use Markov decision processes to formulate collision avoidance as a sequence of decisions. If you take a look at this diagram here, the idea is that you're at a particular state, shown as the green circles one, two, three. And you're going to take an action to move to say A or B, maybe to turn left or right, to climb or descend. And then from based on those actions, you have certain probabilities of what your state will be next. And every state is assigned a reward or a cost. The biggest cost, of course, is if two planes collide. So you have a large negative cost if two planes collide. Rewards would be missing. You probably have a small cost for giving an advisory or warning to the pilot. And that's so you build into the system that you don't want to give unnecessary warnings. The second part of the technique beyond the Markov decision processes is to use dynamic <coughs> programming. If you imagine two planes approaching each other, the complete number of trajectories to describe what might happen over the next several minutes is huge. But instead, by describing those trajectories as a set of states using dynamic programming, it can become computationally feasible. The impressive thing about this, as I'll describe in a minute, is even though we're using statistical and probabilistic techniques to replace the determinant, deterministic technique. In fact, the system is more accurate, safer, and gives fewer unnecessary alerts. And that's really the promise of what's going on. So here's a diagram of this new 
Markov decision processes system called ACAS-X, where we combine the probabilistic decision model that I described above earlier and multi-objective utility model. This means describing the value or the cost of each state. The system that puts it all together is an optimized logic table, and so now you have a more simple and less risky way to update the system to incorporate things like new technologies. So the system is more robust, reduces unnecessary alerts, and makes it easier to incorporate new features. Testing shows, not um, on-air testing, but simulation testing shows that relative to the existing TCAS system, the collision risk is reduced by 47%, and the overall alert rate is reduced by 40%. So the FAA likes this a lot. Today the FAA is developing new standards for implementing this. Then they'll move on to flight tests, and then presumably towards the end of this decade, implementation. So we've taken a look at examples of three of these seven meta themes. How do you now go about actually turning insights like these meta themes into new startup companies or into greater competitive advantage for the startup companies that you already have or new products or services for your companies. Let's talk about that for a minute. And what I really want to talk about is what I would call disruptive innovation, a substantial and abrupt improvement in performance. That's what you all really want, right? That's what we all want. It requires knowledge and creativity, but if we do it, it can provide a substantial competitive advantage to your company. Well, even tech code here is trying to apply disruptive innovation to accelerators the same way all of you are trying to provide apply disruptive innovation to your companies, whether you're an entrepreneur or an investor or someone else. I've done some research on innovation with my co-worker, Sarah Ritz. And what we've done is to actually look at successful examples of innovation. People who have gone from that initial question that they seek to answer in R&D, all the way to successful commercialization at scale. And using this bottoms-up approach, We've tried to see if every case is different or if we can generalize and extract some features that seem to be characteristic of successful innovators. And the first thing that we found is that disruptive innovation seems to fall into one of four categories. Some people work on improved solutions to familiar problems. This is the case where everyone can see the problem. Gee, it would be nice if my lithium-ion batteries in my phone and laptop had longer life. Well, no surprise, everyone sees that problem. But what if I'm a material scientist or a chemist? What if I'm a software engineer developing battery management software? And what if I could find a way to improve the performance of a lithium-ion battery, not by 2 or 3 percent, but by 50 or 100 percent? That would be a disruptive innovation. Basic research. That's the more methodical and fundamental approach to solving a problem. That's where you go do physics or chemistry or biology to really understand something in detail, to try to understand it at a deeper level than anyone has. Maybe it's a failure mode or something limiting performance, and then that leads to disruptive innovation. In the case of the arc of technology evolution, we found innovators who see where technology is going. They're able to see the big picture across time and see where technology will be in a few years and recognize that when technology gets there, new things will be possible that haven't been possible in the past. And business model innovation often aren't stressing technology, but they're thinking of new ways of putting revenue generation together with services and products that people want. Um, Uber and Lyft, I suppose, are an example of business model innovation. The notion of a service to provide transportation has been around for a while, 
but Uber and Lyft were a disruptive change on the old model of taxi cabs. With every, whichever one of these four types someone's using, and maybe you're aware of other types, these were the ones we saw in our research, the goal is generally improved products and services, or entirely new products and services, or entirely new business models. We also found that the successful innovators themselves tended to be one of three types. There may be other types. Some of you may be another type. But these were the types that we saw. We called the first type the interdisciplinary, the person who's talking to others from diverse fields and bringing the perspectives, the innovation, and the understanding from a wide range of people across a wide range of domain expertise to bear on the problem. The second one we discovered was the diligent scientist, the one who works methodically to unravel secrets that others had missed. And then the futurist, trying to see what the future looks like and develop a new business for that future vision. So once you combine these elements, what's the process? Again, although these innovators were all working differently to close a gap between what existed today and what they thought might exist in the future. There seemed to be some common elements. They all began with a dream, a big visionary statement of what they wanted to achieve. I think dreams are important. They're important because they can help you to motivate others, uh, employees, investors. They can help you communicate to your customer base what your grand vision is. But dreams by themselves don't work. They're often too big, too vague, too overwhelming. So the second thing that successful innovators do in our experience is translate that dream into specific, actionable needs. The individual steps are component parts to get to that grand vision. They then identify the barriers and hurdles that are in their way. Maybe they need new technology. Maybe they just need some know-how that they lack and they need to add something to their team. And then they can actually get to work on building solutions. The final thing that we saw in our research was factors that can lead to enhanced innovation. We found that flexible funding mechanisms and collaborative environments are helpful. We found that most successful innovators had a fundamental conviction that the problem could be solved, even maybe when there wasn't the sound basis for believing that, almost as an article of faith. They often took an interdisciplinary approach. They were often visionary and, as I mentioned, the three innovation archetypes. So now let's put together everything we've talked about tonight. How can we couple what innovation research is telling us about successful disruptive innovation with one particular dynamic field at the moment, the data science revolution? And I think you have to do it by applying it to specific businesses and industries. I don't think you can do it in the abstract. But that's the question. How can artificial intelligence, big data, the Internet of Things, and related technologies be used to enable new businesses, drive increased revenue and profitability, and create sustainable competitive advantage, and how are specific industries affected? So let's take a look at how that process goes. I think virtually every industry is affected by the data science revolution. Some of these are pretty obvious. Consumer electronics. Think of your smartphones. Think of your wearable medical devices or your watches. Think of your computers. The consumer electronics industry is in many respects the industry that's driving much of the data revolution and is also the way you consume and interact with a lot of the data. Another obvious one is retailing. Think about the way Amazon has totally reshaped what retailing is all about. And of course, social media. It's hard to imagine social media, Twitter, Facebook, and so on, separate from the data revolution. 
but there's some not so obvious industries as well. Public health and biomedicine. Increasingly, electronic medical records of very large groups of people are being analyzed to learn things about rare devices, rare um, diseases, or unusual drug interactions. Um, wearable medical devices are giving us new information on ourselves. Drug discovery is being impacted by the data revolution. <clears throat> Energy. We talked earlier about the example of smart grid and demand response. Finance and insurance. It may come as a surprise to you, it came as a surprise to me to learn that the insurance industry is being impacted by the data science revolution more than perhaps any other industry on the planet. And insurance companies worldwide are determined to take advantage of it to increase market share and avoid becoming irrelevant dinosaurs. They're wondering how smart devices like the Internet of Things and cars and smartphones that can monitor our behavior might help them out to be able to distinguish high risk from low risk people. Or how insurance companies might use real time information from sensors to help us avoid risk. Wouldn't it be great if when a storm is just four hours away, we could get information on where flooding is going to occur and where the power outages are going to be? We're all getting used to this idea of customized and individualized services. What happens if that gets applied to an industry where the entire business model is based on pooling risk in large groups? What does insurance even look like if there's no longer large groups and we try to offer individual insurance. Automotive and transportation. I don't need to tell any of you, certainly none of you who were at CES in Las Vegas last week or who have read a newspaper or been to the internet in the last week and a half. But the automobile and transportation industry is changing completely. Assisted and autonomous driving. New models that change how we think of car ownership much smarter public transportation systems. The transportation industry, in a very short time, will probably look very different than it does today. And even the food and beverage industry, sensors that can help us identify food that's gone bad before we eat it and get sick. Imagine you walk up to a vending machine for a cold drink. What if the vending machine interrogates your state by checking with your smartphone and wearable device as you walk up to the Coke machine, and when you arrive there, it says, you know, you're looking a little dehydrated today, and I see that your potassium electrolyte level is a little low, so let me prepare a custom beverage for you. <laughs> I wonder how far in the future something like that is, and in fact, beverage companies are thinking about exactly that. And as with many of these industries, they're all struggling with how personalized and invasive can these things get before we all get so creeped out and disgusted that we don't want any part of it and we just turn our devices off or go find a different beverage manufacturer or automobile manufacturer. So the point isn't lost on any of the companies here that if they get this right, they win big. And if they screw up, we will vote with our feet and avoid them. Let me tell you a little bit about how I think we can all, you can all, apply these thoughts to particular companies. I think you pick an industry like the industry you're working in, and you think about who the new entrants are into that industry. What are the new products and services? What are the new business models emerging? And you also think about adjacent industries. If you're Google, it seems like almost everything's an adjacent industry. Let's see, Google's a car company. Google, I'm pretty sure, is an insurance company. Uh, they're probably a travel agency. So they're clearly way more than a search engine. Um, Apple seems to be well on its way to being way more than a consumer electronics company, and so on. And so thinking about adjacencies is another way to do that. I suspect many of you are working on different kinds of smart devices, and even for those of you who aren't, it's a particular area that we're all familiar with, and it's a new emerging theme in 2016 for tech code. So let's wrap up tonight by trying to apply this to smart devices. 
And I mean all kinds of smart devices. I mean those smartphones in your pocket. I mean those wearable devices. How many of you are wearing a Fitbit or right now? Yeah, a few of you. Or thermostats and light bulbs that communicate with the internet on your home. How many of you have internet connected thermostats or light bulbs in your home? Well, yeah. A few of you. So let's think about that market for a minute. Let's think about what some of the industry dynamics are in this industry of smart devices. So any thoughts? So what do I mean by industry dynamic? Um, uh, almost anything changing through the industry. So I would say one of the industry dynamics here is a huge number of new entrants. I think here we're seeing products not just coming from large incumbents, but new entrants. Um, another industry dynamic maybe would be, I, I would say, most of what we're seeing in this field is currently driven more by someone's clever idea of what we could do, what we have the technical capability to do, than what's actually delivering value. I would argue most of the smart devices actually aren't very useful and actually aren't providing much value. That it's, that it's an industry in its early stages of people trying to figure out what's worth doing. Any other thoughts on, on industry dynamics for smart devices? Okay, we'll move on. Then I think it's interesting to go on and ask, what are some of the specific impacts in this field of the data revolution, of this notion of massive data and powerful analytics? For example, your Fitbit can tell you not only how you've been exercising, but it can make some pretty insightful suggestions based on some pretty sophisticated information. Your Nest thermostat can not only learn your habits, but it's going to know what the weather's going to be tomorrow, and it's going to, in the future, maybe even know what the electric grid is doing at that moment. You can imagine a point in the not-too-distant future where your Nest thermostat and your rooftop solar panels and your local battery storage, because, I don't know, because your Tesla battery is being used for local storage, are all communicating with each other in an intelligent way. I think it's good to think about threats and opportunities for your companies and others, but I find it helpful to distinguish between threats and opportunities for incumbents and new interns. I think we're all infatuated with startup companies, and we all know how effective they can be at winning, at stealing market share away from incumbents. But I think it's helpful to spend time thinking about what the strengths and resources of incumbents are. They have established capability, they have supply chain, they have distribution, they have customer relationships, they have brand recognition, which as we all know can be good or bad, but they have brand recognition. And so thinking about threats and opportunities separately for incumbents and new entrants can be very powerful. I've heard a lot of smart device companies say they want to be just like Nest. What the heck does that even mean? What does it mean to be like Nest? I've heard light bulb companies say that we're not a light bulb company, we're a, I don't know, a network of illumination services company. <laughs> so what does it really mean to be like Nest, other than the fact that we got acquired by Google for a lot of money, so the founder and employees made a lot of money. So what is it about Nest? I, I suspect you all have thoughts on that. But, but somehow they've managed to elevate the notion of a thermostat to be a whole lot more than a thermostat. Whatever you think of Google's acquisition of Nest, they clearly were not buying a thermostat company. I think we can agree. <laughs> Whatever they were buying, it was not a thermostat company. Maybe it's an understanding of how humans interact with technology. Maybe it's an understanding of how to get monetary value out of understanding our behavior. Maybe it's the opportunity to tie thermostats to other products and services. But it's those kinds of things. And, and I'd love to hear all of your ideas about what it means. The other thing that a lot of people have said is they fear that Google and Amazon are their biggest competitors. And what's interesting is they say that even if they're not in search or online retail. They say that no matter where they are. Again. What does that even really mean? I actually think in that case, there are some interesting things we can learn 
from Google's and Amazon's remarkable success. But I think the insight comes from peeling the layers of the onion and going deep. What is it about Amazon that's successful if you believe they're a potential threat to your business? Is it their excellent customer service? Maybe. Is it the ability for customers to compare products from multiple vendors on a more or less level playing field side by side with more or less unbiased reviews from users? Maybe. Is it just that you've got a trusted source for the transaction no matter where you're going? Maybe. Similarly, if you're afraid of Google, what, what is it about Google? Is it its incredible skill at personalization, right? We've all had the spooky experience of sending an email to someone, hey, I will see you at Tahoe this weekend, and it takes about a millisecond for you to start getting ads from hotels at Lake Tahoe. It's a little scary how quickly uh, your email is read and they figure out what you're doing. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's because the search engine works so well. Maybe it's because diverse services like maps and so on are so well integrated. So we've talked tonight about the data science revolution, we've taken a look at innovation, and then we've tried to pull it all together to see how that can be used to create new businesses, or new products and services to make existing businesses more competitive. I wish you all the best of luck with your ventures. Thank you very much. All right, thank you guys, and thank, let's thank Dr. Eglash one more time for all of his amazing minutes for a Q&A. Um, I'm sure many of you guys have questions based on what you've heard. So um, does anyone want to start with a question for Dr. Eglash? Yeah. All right. What are your thoughts on kids and privacy given all this artificial intelligence and this data gathering and articles like VTech coming out the other day that what is it, 3 million kids have their information back overseas? Do you want me to repeat that question? Let me just repeat that question real quickly since we're not using that mic. Uh, so he just asked about kids and privacy, and uh, he asked about a company named VTech. VTech, was it? That just came out um, that said kids' informations were getting hacked. Yeah, the whole question of privacy and security, I think, is, is, is a critically important one. And it seems to me that we need to do a lot more and continue to be diligent and fight for greater privacy and security. Um, but the, the risks and potential of, of us not doing that um, are just much too great. It's interesting to me to occasionally run across people who feel differently. Um, I was recently working with some utilities commissioners in a small town with municipally owned utilities. And a number of the commissioners felt that concerns about privacy and security were going so far that they were impeding what would otherwise be sensible efforts to encourage things like energy conservation. And whether you agree or not, I think this notion of a tension between people willing to chip away at privacy and security to achieve different good consequences versus people that want to protect privacy and security even if, let's say, we have a less sustainable energy system. It's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I think there are some other aspects of privacy and security that are particularly important to the topic that we're talking about tonight, and, and I want to just pick one. If we imagine all these internet-connected devices in our homes, imagine, if you will, an internet-connected front door lock. Right, so this is a great thing. You walk up to your front door, and you push a few buttons on your cell phone, and it communicates through the cloud, because chances are your phone's not talking over Bluetooth directly to the door lock, and it unlocks the door for you. Or you're a thousand miles away, or two miles away, and you say, oh, gee, did I remember to lock the door? And you can check, and you can confirm that it's locked, or lock it, or lock it. Now let's think about hacking. Let's think about software updates. You know, most of you own a cell phone, if statistics are right, for 18 or 24 months, and then you throw it away and buy a new one. And even at that, it can be hard to get software updates 
towards the end of life of an old model. Imagine now your front door lock. It probably cost $50. You installed it hoping it would be around for 10 years. The company that built it has no incentive to provide upgrades. The company that built it may not even exist anymore. How do you make sure that that front door lock can't get hacked? In a recent study of Internet Connected and Internet of Things devices, Hewlett Packard found that 80% of them don't even have secure software updates. So while it's being updated, someone could gain control of it. Gee, all it takes is a reset command, and now you can't even get into your own house. Imagine the first time you're locked out of your own house, or the first time that camera on your TV is watching you. So when you think you're watching TV, your TV is watching you. So it seems to me that a lot needs to be done around privacy and security and encryption. I think it's important. I think part of it is the technology of privacy and security, but I think part of it requires creative solutions to this other problem I was describing of manufacturers going away and no longer having an incentive. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned about the deep dive project, uh, this open source. Uh, recently, uh, Google announced they are opening up the AI and called TensorFlow. What do you think about that? But uh, I'm actually very uh, We are doing our company, this company, this company, this company that we are developing our own AI. And uh, what is the view, you know, developing our own versus like open source from Google? Oh, yeah, he basically asked, "What's uh, what's your opinion about the the difference between open sourcing information versus developing your own technology?" I, I'm not sure I have anything particularly insightful to add to that, and I think that your own experience and the experience of others in this room would probably be be just as valuable. Clearly, there are many cases where open source versions can be used as the beginning of building a proprietary solution. And I suspect there's lots of examples in the room where people started with an open source engine of some type and then overlaid different proprietary features, user interface, additional computation to come up with their own, uh, their own version that was unique to their company. Um, there are undoubtedly going to continue to be applications where it makes sense to develop your own versions. One of the places where I'm watching this the closest right now is assisted and autonomous driving. Um, many car manufacturers are, are hard at work right now developing their own systems. And uh, it'll be interesting to see over the next few years whether standard systems evolve, whether um, you know, whether companies that aren't car companies that are somewhere else in the food chain can actually can actually get in there. I think the way you posed the question, it also depends a lot on what you mean by AI. Right? There there can be some fairly specific things where it's pretty straightforward to develop your own application. There can also be things that are so complex that it perhaps makes sense to start with a general purpose solution. I didn't really answer your question, so if you wanted to comment yourself or follow up. But uh, yeah, right now TensorFlow is awesome. Because you say it's awesome. It's very awesome. Yeah. It has a lot of stuff. So prior to it becoming available, you thought you needed to develop your own version, but now you're questioning Tensor. whether you need to. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a catch in that. And what is the catch in that case? Uh, deep dive, they actually have, you actually mentioned that they actually have a lot of companies build their own profiles. Right. But were you saying that there's a catch in the case of yours? I'm sure they will charge money. <laughs> Just like Google Apps. Right. Other questions? Or comments? Uh, I'm just wondering in your experience, have you, uh, with all the data, this big data business, the model is based on the data coming from the consumer. So we are all actually generating a lot of data just for going to Google, Facebook, etc. So aren't we actually the producers of these companies or the consumers? And should there be a, some means of uh, actually 
money spending or some ownership in, in the case of digital language. <coughs> So let me just repeat that question. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you said that um, a lot of these companies are generating revenue from R, R being the consumer's information that we're providing. So shouldn't there be some means of R getting some part of that revenue or having ownership over that information? It, it's such a great question. There's no doubt that data has emerged as a hugely valuable resource. We're used to thinking about other valuable resources like intellectual property and know-how and the physical plant and the employees and the brand. Clearly, we now need to add to that list of valuable resources data. And there's no doubt that we as consumers are contributing to generating a lot of data that has a lot of value. Yeah, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually get the companies that are profiting uh, from that data to somehow pay us for it? That's clearly not going to happen uh, in, in, in any recognizable form. Um, for one thing, as an individual, our contribution to the value is, is negligible. And so, you know, if you threaten to take your, com your, the, your data away unless the company pays you, we'll just, we'll just show you the door and say goodbye. But it does create an opportunity that smart companies have recognized, which is if companies want to do something with that data, if they want to chip away a little bit at the privacy and security you were asking about, Often we will agree to willingly give up our data to opt in if we get something of value in return. And so that notion of an exchange or transaction, where the company doesn't merely say to you, here's how I'm going to use your data so I can make a lot of money and screw you if you don't like it, but instead the company says, gee, would you please allow me to use your data, I'm going to use it in this way, and by the way, if you allow me to use your data in this way, Here's something that I'm going to give you that you might consider valuable. So there's a transaction, there's an exchange, and, uh, and that can be, I think, something that makes us feel good about participating. Um, and so I think, I think we're going to start, start to, see, to see that notion. There's a whole lot of other really interesting topics triggered by this question. The whole notion of proprietary versus publicly available data as data becomes more and more valuable, I think we're all acutely aware of the fact that some of the most valuable data is only accessible to the individual companies that own it. And so whether that's going to continue that way, whether companies can have incentives to make data more readily available, this notion of data for the public good or data for the good of humanity is a notion that's emerging. The big bank, J.P. Morgan, created the J.P. Morgan Institute to make a large fraction of its proprietary data available for humanitarian activities. Um, there's a National Academies panel right now taking a look at ways that multiple data sets can be combined to help the government do things more accurately, studying poverty, studying nutrition, things like that. So I think uh, there's, there's some initial movements in the direction of of trying to make more data uh, more widely available despite its value, or maybe because of its value, maybe to unlock its value to things other than just the profit of individual companies. Uh, have you looked into uh, cross-referenced uh, organizational behavior and cultural norms of privacy around the world with some of your work? So he asked if uh, you have cross-referenced a little complicated there. Cross reference cultural norms and. Cultural norms of privacy and organizational behavior. Cultural norms of privacy and organizational behavior. Uh, Vitaly, that's of course a question that I should turn around and ask you because I suspect um, you're an expert on that and have some thoughts on it. Um, but, but I'll at least take an initial step. There's no doubt that notions of privacy vary. Uh, from country to country around the world. We've certainly seen way more privacy protections in Europe than in the U.S., for example. And we clearly see companies, since you mentioned organizational behavior, approaching privacy in different ways, right? Within 10 or 20 miles of where we're sitting right now, there are companies that are notoriously, right, obsessively private. Um, and there are other companies we could name that I think are trying to find ways to be more open, although perhaps not always successfully. Um, 
you want to add something to it? Because I, I think it's probably a subject you know something about as well. Uh, just, just coincidentally, I've, I've researched some things recently about the different cultural norms or uh, the value of privacy is lower in, in more impoverished countries and vice versa. Yeah. yeah, so Vitaly was saying that the notions of privacy are valued less in more impoverished uh, countries. I think that's the first time tonight that we mentioned this notion of, uh, you know, a disadvantaged people and, and countries with, with very low income. And uh, that, that's a whole other aspect of, of the topics that, uh, that we've been talking about tonight that we could all spend, spend time on. And, and, and there are just wonderfully important aspects of that, opportunities to use the sorts of data techniques we're talking about to do humanitarian good, particularly for some of the least advantaged people in the world. Um, and as we think of business models, the whole notion of the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, and uh, while we all tend to gravitate toward business models of serving the wealthiest people on the planet, um, there can in fact be wonderful business models serving uh, People who are not among the wealthiest, uh, and so that might be uh, that might be what our uh, what the, the gentleman with his hand up there wants to comment on, uh, or it might be a good topic over over beer and wine. Yes, <laughs> well, kind of. I mean, I, I I wanted to address an earlier point that you made, which is which keeps coming back up, and that is that you mentioned something about losing control of perhaps your front door or something like that through digital means, somebody hacking into your your <laughs> lock, but. You know, if you look on YouTube, you can see there are hundreds of videos on how to open a lock right now. And if, if everybody in here knew how easy it was to do that, I'm not saying I come from that background or anything like that, but <laughs> if you knew how easy it was, you would feel that the, the risks of taking on a digital lock are extraordinarily low. And, and, and I think that this kind of applies to a lot of things that, that we're dealing with, a lot of technological stuff. And by the way, this isn't a question, it is a statement. So we're, we lack exposure to these new paradigms and these new contexts. And our syntax is a little old-fashioned for dealing with all of the things that we've invented recently. We haven't quite, we haven't quite been able to put it all together yet, like how it works as an ecosystem. And I think, therefore, when I, you know, when I think about a digital lock, and I, I actually reviewed a digital lock a few years ago, it, it was, the idea was very scary, that somebody's going to figure this out and get into my house. But, I mean, they can just break the glass anyway, <laughs> you know? And if I get locked out of my house, I can break the glass to get into it. And I really think that we're, like, ev all of our fears about all of these things are really based on the fact that we're just little kids that don't quite understand what it is that we've gotten ourselves into. However, we've gotten ourselves into it, and we don't really have a choice of going back. And so, while I don't like it when I have lots of, you know, my information out in the world and everybody knows who I am, I do believe that I'm just going to have to come to terms with that over time. I don't really know how I'm going to do that. I'm going to cry a lot, be really pissed along the way. But I think it's just, I, 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 it's not something I can stop. You can't stop progress, right? I think everyone heard that, so. <laughs> that all feel. Do you have any comments? No, that's fine. All right, great. Um, I think we're out. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. I think we're out of time. I mean, I know it's getting late, but I think Dr. Eglash will stick around for a little bit. Um, he will, so you can come up and speak to him over a glass of wine or a beer. Um, but so thank you again all for coming um, and supporting us. And thank, let's thank Dr. Eglash one more time for coming.